you very much for organizing this and for inviting me to this uh, extremely interesting uh, workshop. Thank you very much. Okay, I'd like to talk to you about something that's called fluctuation-dominated order. It's a phrase for something very definite, which I will try to explain to you. And I'll argue and actually show you a calculation which shows that this sort of order arises in, in an Ising model with power law decaying interactions. This is the thrust of the talk. Okay, so let me... The work is done together with Satya Majumdar and David Mukamel, published recently. And Saroj Nandi at TIFR Hyderabad is working along with me uh, on further aspects of this problem. Okay. Mm. Uh, I'm doing something wrong, I'm sure. Oh, the stick isn't here. Yes, yes, okay. Thank you. Right. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay. So let's uh, start uh, you know, thinking about this. Suppose you have an ordered state and a disordered state, and you go between. You ask, what is the nature of the state that comes in between? Well, normally you would think, and you'd be right most of the time, it's a critical point, right? So we are very familiar with the critical point. Here is a critical state, power law decays of correlation functions, fractal structures, etc., and critical exponents which characterize everything. Now, the question is, what would happen if you had, for instance, power law interactions? And you might think that, look, exponents will change, the character of the correlations will change, etc. But, you know, still within the realm of critical points. And indeed, that is what happens usually. However, there's an, another possibility. It's a possibility which arises in several models, also in experiment. And that's the possibility that I'll talk about. It's called fluctuation-dominated phase ordering. It occurs between an ordered and a disordered phase, but it's different from critical behavior. And it's different in a very definite sense, which I'll characterize. Qualitatively, what it has is giant fluctuations. Fluctuations that, that do not damp down in the thermodynamic limit of ordered regions which are macroscopic. Manifestation is that if you look at the two-point correlation function, it's a scaling function of, which I'll tell you about, but it's the scaling function itself is singular. This is what we will see. And as I said, it, this is found in several systems. The Ising model with power laws is something that I'll come to, but I'll argue that this actually happens a little more generically, and uh, in fact, for the next few minutes, I'll talk about other systems in which this sort of order arises. We'll come back to the calculation in the Ising model a little later. Okay, the system then in which this was first observed, it's a model system, it's very simple. It's a fluctuating potential and particles on it. You know, this simple to imagine is have a handkerchief. Take this handkerchief and, you know, shake it around, fluctuate it. Put some very light particles on it, sugar, okay? As you shake, what happens? Okay, there's gravity. Things tend to fall into valleys. So there are valleys here, there, everywhere. It's a collection of here and there. But as you shake, what's a valley now will become a hill, and the hill will become a valley. So particles will move around. What happens at very long times? So the answer is, in some sense, the particles actually come close to each other. They come together, macroscopically together. The state reminds one of phase separation. And we'll talk about the state in some detail. 
but uh, this is what happens. So this is a, a part of a well-known problem that has been studied in many contexts, namely this problem of passive scalars, particles which are affected by fluctuating fields, often fluid flows, but not necessarily, but which do not act back on the flow itself. So this system, I'm going to argue, shows this sort of order. A simple model is simply a line, potential one dimension, with the fluctuating interface, particles with some size, let's say, and hardcore interactions falling in this potential. Question is, what happens? Well, they cluster. Clusters cannot be at one spot because of steric interactions, so they spread out. And the uh, uh, ultimate state, as I said, is one which is where most of the particles are together. But this state is very dynamic. It moves around in space, the, the um, large cluster. And unlike normal phase separation, the interface or the boundary between phases is not sharp. The interface is very broad, as, as broad, roughly, as each ordered region. This is the qualitative picture. More quantitatively, what do you see? Well, so here is the result of some simulations. Looking at the two-point correlation function, density-density correlation function, as a function of time. Imagine that you start with particles spread all over, statistically homogeneously, and then you keep shaking. Well, as I said, the physics is very simple. Things cluster. And then as time passes, they cluster more, meaning there are fewer clusters, but larger clusters. So if you think of the cluster size as giving you a scale, that scale depends on time. It grows as a power of time, okay, depending on your shaking dynamics, and sets the scale for actual scaling to happen. So, uh, for instance, if you look at the two-point correlation function, at a time t, here is this length scale, and the correlation function is a function not of separation, but of separation divided by the scale that has come in, L of t. This, by the way, is well known. It's a well known law in uh, coarsening theory, as it's called, the approach to the phase separated state. However, the, okay, and this sort of scaling works well. So you can see this data over many times collapsing onto a single curve here. But the surprise was and is that the curve itself has a singularity, and the singularity is a cusp singularity, cusp singularity at the origin. So it's a scaling function. You have to take the limit large r, large l. For fixed r by l, look at the function. And as r by l goes to 0 in the scaling limit, this function actually is singular. The, there's a physical significance to this singularity, the Porod law, which I will not enter into, fails, it breaks down in this system. The cusp exponent is what I'm calling alpha, not the alpha of the meeting. It's the cusp exponent here. And uh, its value depends on the dynamics of the driving. Uh, uh, so I in a very definite way, which uh, one could enter. Uh, again, a couple of words about the cusp. Uh, so, as I said, the, the scaling, the correlation function is a scaling function. The function, as a function of its argument, is singular as y goes to zero. Here's the nature of the singularity: it's a cusp, and this exponent alpha is less than one, which means cusp. The Porat law, which I alluded to is the statement that alpha equals 1, and it holds in normal coarsening systems. It fails here. It breaks down. And uh, we can enter into the re reasons it does. It's a very simple physical reason, but 
I won't enter to, into it right now. Essentially, it has to do with the fact that the interface is rather broad. It's not a sharp interface between two phases. What about the order parameter itself? Well, what is the order parameter? We have a conserved number of particles. And the question is, where, where are they? You know, are they here or are they spread out or not? And the way to capture that fact is to look at Fourier modes. So if you look at the Fourier transform of what might be a good uh, you know, characterization of the order, um, if you look at any fixed value of the Fourier mode k, the signal drops as the size increases. However, if you look at the longest mode, the largest mode, that approaches a limit. Okay, you can see as the size increases, it goes there. The second largest mode also approaches the limit. So does the third, etc. So any finite number of mo finite numbered mode will have a non-zero expectation value in this state. Okay. So there you are. However, if you look at the dynamics, if you look at the time dependence of any one mode, you find that that fluctuates all the place. It goes from essentially perfect order to almost, you might think, no order because it dips almost to zero. But whenever the first mo dips to zero, the second picks up. Physical meaning, very simple. It means the cluster breaks up. So here is time, here is space. Here is your cluster. It's grown a little. Good. But come here, and you see the cluster breaks up into two pieces. Then joins again. Very rarely, three pieces. Sometimes four pieces, but never an infinite number of pieces. So it's circulating. The system is circulating in an attractor of ordered states. Here it is. So this is my sort of pencil depiction. Here are states with one large cluster, two large clusters, three. And here's the majority of states disorders. Your system moves around here. So dynamically, it's going all over, but it's staying within the realm of order. Uh, turns out, there are many systems which actually, over the years, we found show this cusp singularity and this order. And uh, let me just list them for then turning to the calculation in the Ising. This is the agenda for the rest of the talk. Uh, yeah. Okay, passive scalars I've talked about. Active pneumatics, these are long rod shaped molecules which move preferentially along. And uh, this is a problem of great complexity. And it's not, the phase diagram is not entirely sorted out. But there is a large region in parameter space, according to these authors, the last authors here where the correlation functions are actually singular in the way that I described. They have that scaling property. There's an experiment on vibrated rods, uh, which shows giant number fluctuations, which has been reanalyzed by oops, the same three authors. And uh, uh, they conclude again that there is a singular scaling function buried in the data here. Um, also arises in a model of inelastic granular collapse, uh, which I won't enter into, and also into a, an interesting thing that on you know on the the cell surface there are lots of uh, molecules which need to proteins which need to get together in order to do their function. I I can't tell you more. I, I mean what the function is, etc. I don't know. But how do they get in get, get together? Well, there's the actin cytoskeleton, which is there, which pulls them in, very much like a valley. So they fall in, get together, thrown out again. And uh, you know the, the uh, people who have analyzed this, again, looked at correlation functions and see the manifestation of the singularity. So what I wanted to say is that it's not just a theorist's dream. It seems to be there in several systems. OK, let's go further. 
Let me now come to the Isaac bar. When I say long range interactions, I perhaps don't mean long range in the sense that we have been technically using the word long range, you know, as something power crossing the dimension, but uh, power law decays. Okay. Turns out that, so I'm looking, going to look at a one dimensional model, okay, with the uh, variable sigma. And uh, for a long time it has been known that the case where the interactions fall off as 1 over r squared, r being the separation, shows a finite temperature phase transition. This goes back to a very interesting paper of Thaulis in 1969. Later, rigorous proofs were given by Eisenman. But in fact, there is a finite temperature transition because the interactions decay sufficiently slowly. After th soon after that was this very powerful and interesting paper of Anderson and Yuval, who connected the condo problem, quantum mechanical, you know, uh, magnetic purity problem, to exactly the sizing chain with one of our squared decays. And they pointed out, as far as the Ising model goes, that the correlation function diverges as you approach the critical point. No surprise, you might think. However, Thaulis had already shown that the magnetization jumps at the critical point. So this is a transition which had elements of first order, the jump, and second order, the divergence. So it began to be referred to as a mixed order transition. And uh, this point still stands for the model. I'm going to look at a variant of this model. And this is a variant that was suggested by uh, Bar and Mukamel in 2014. And the idea is very simple. You still have a 1 over r squared decay, but the interactions one j, j of r going like 1 over r squared act only between spins in the same cluster. So look at this. Here's a picture of spins, with clusters of size L1, L2, etc., to L6. So this interaction, so here's the na nearest neighbor interaction. Here's the longer range interaction. But this operates only within this cluster, or only within spins of this cluster. So there's a cutoff. It's a dynamic cutoff, because clusters keep changing in time. But given a configuration, this was what it is. So there's a perfectly fine time-independent Hamiltonian you can write down to express this by constructing an operator which embodies the cutoff. But that doesn't add to understanding the model. I hope the model is clear. Well, so let me just state some facts about this. This is actually exactly solvable, this model. It exhibits a mixed order transition. And uh, the reason it was suggested is it relates to a model of DNA denaturation, which I will not enter, well-known model, known as the poland sharaga model. But let's see what this does. What I'm going to argue is that there's, along the critical locus, Okay. The system actually exhibits this fluctuation dominated order and not normal critical behavior. Okay, so this is where I'm heading. Okay. So let's see. Here we are with the uh Anatonian. Well, since this is uh, confined to a single cluster, we can write the value of this in a certain configuration given a certain cluster lens for, for a given cluster. If clusters are large, which they are near the transition point, there are certain simplifications you can make. I mean, otherwise you can keep full sums. And uh, it turns out that you know, the uh, summation of Rj of R uh, involves log L, Ln, because you're integrating 1 over R squared twice. So the effective Hamiltonian, so this is what makes the problem solvable. The configuration is written now 
not in terms of spins, but in terms of cluster lengths. And here it is. Here's the Hannah union. It has two parts. One is something that depends on cluster lengths, ln. Then there's a term. So this is like a chemical potential, uh, capital delta, but which multiplies the number of clusters. Remember, that's dynamically changing. So that's not a fixed number. Uh, this is what it is. And uh, uh, so the full configuration is specified by n, the number of domain walls or clusters, and these l's. Prashendu, how much time do we have, if any? Oh, good. All right. Fine. So uh, coming back, repeating. Here's the Hamiltonian written out now in terms of uh, the new uh, um, variables, which are the cluster lengths rather than individual spins. Okay. This is actually solvable. Cluster distributions, for instance, if you ask for the probability that a given uh, configuration has cluster lengths L1 through Ln, well, that's uh, simply uh, 1 over Ln to, the power to a power small c, which I'll define in a minute if I haven't done it here. In, uh, okay, maybe I did it in the previous case. I don't remember. But okay, little c, uh, so, so, so let, let me just acquaint you with the um, uh, uh, variables. Okay, it's capital C is the strength of the coupling. 1 over r squared coupling. Little c is capital C divided by temperature. Okay, so can you please remember that? I forgot to write it. Okay, right. But you see the uh, cluster size distribution is simply a bunch of power laws, except you have a constraint. And the constraint is that the sum of all the LNs must add up to a fixed number L. So in this system, L is fixed, N is not fixed, but the Ln is fixed. Okay. Turns out you can deal with this, you can solve it, and uh, the solution is here, it involves polylog functions and so on, but it doesn't matter. Let's just go through the physics of the answer. If you ask for, so you can ask for the length of the longest cluster. How is that distributed? This is something that is well studied and answered by the theory of extremes. And here is the answer. You have power law distributions of clusters. So you think you have a fresh air distribution. And indeed, depending on the value of little c, so remember c is capital C divided by temperature. c is small c, that capital C divided by temperature is larger than um, 2, then you indeed have a fresh air distribution. Don't worry about the form, but just notice that the z is the length of the largest cluster divided by capital L to some power. And since c is bigger than 2, this L scales sublinearly with the size. But cross 2 now. Go to little c between 1 and 2. And what you find is okay, the, you can work out the function. It's a piecewise analytic function. I won't get, get into what it is. But the important thing is the argument is now proportional to capital L, which says that the largest cluster is of the order of system size. However, if you look at the probability distribution of the largest cluster, this is the psi, you know, it's a fraction of the psi, but it it's a broad distribution. It does not go to a delta function. Okay, so in the, here I'm sort of repeating a little bit what I've said. So here is your phase diagram in the plane of little c and fugacity of the walls. You know, how many walls are there? All right, so never mind the details. There's a phase boundary, paramagnetic, ferromagnetic, and uh, the, the size of the largest cluster is sublinear in size in this region, 
but linear in the size over here. In other words, the five minutes, okay. Uh, the cluster is very large, it's macroscopic, but with a broad distribution of sites. Okay. Um, let's not get into details here. It's more or less saying what I said earlier. And let's just uh, go to the next slide. Now, if you so this is what gives you a hint of this fluctuation in dominated order. Because if there's a single cluster of very large size, that's ordered, I mean, in the sense of long range order. So what is going on? Well, so let's look at the two-point correlation function because I claim that that is the sort of unequivocal signature of uh, the order. And indeed, you can do the calculation. It, it's a little, I mean, uh, it's not great involved. It's, it's something that you can down and do. And you can actually carry through, you know, correctly, you know, uh, exactly in the limit, r going to infinity, l going to infinity, with the r by l held constant. And what you find is that if little c is less than 2, between 1 and 2, okay, certain simplifications happen, and the two-point correlation function is 1 minus something, but notice this, r by l to the power 2 minus c. It's a cusp. The cusp exponent depends continuously on the parameters of the problem, namely little c. And so you might think, okay, that's nice. And uh, okay, you can find an account of this in a paper that we published recently. But uh, let's ask the following. This is all very good. We had a spin model, changed it to cluster model, solved the model, and found this phase diagram. But given our original Ising model, which part of little c does it span? It's not obvious and it's not true that it goes from 0 to infinity. It turns out, and it's not very difficult to show, but I'll just tell you that as you change capital C in the problem, that's your parameter, the strength of the long-range coupling, from 0 to infinity, Little c, which is the ratio of capital C to, let's say, Tc, changes very little. It changes from 1 to 1.17, it turns out, about 1.17. In other words, your full Ising model is confined to just a small part of this um, phase, uh, transition line. Fortunately for my story, that portion happens to be on the red part of the line. That's the fluctuation dominated order. So the conclusion is, no matter how much you change this, um, uh, yeah, I'll stop now. Um, uh, 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 the, the strength of the coupling, you have only fluctuation dominated order in the way that I've characterized it. Conclude now. Uh, what I've told you, simple, there is a sort of state that is coming up in many sorts of systems. It's called fluctuation dominated order. This is our name for it. It's an alternative to critical behavior. If you find large bits of things that are moving around and, you know, maybe you can look for these signatures, I mean, if, if anybody does. The key characteristics is that the scaling functions are Fluctuations are enormous. And there is a relation to mixed order transitions which we have not actually sorted out in all situations, but which we would like to. Thank you. So thank you. Very nice talk. I have a question regarding the second part in connection to the introduction. So in the introduction, you spoke about the uh, you talked about the dynamics. Yes. In the second part, it was the Statics. statical properties. Yes. So 